So there's a story of a couple that have been married for many, 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 many years. And the man is ill. He's very, very ill. And he's been in and out of a coma. Um, and it's, his wife has been by his side the whole time. And one day he kind of comes back into conscious awareness and he, he calls his wife even closer to him. And so she takes her ear to his, his mouth so she can hear him. And he says, you know, I've been thinking that I've been through some rough times and you've been there. You know, when I lost my job, you were right there by my side. And when, when we lost our house, it burned down, you were right there by my side. And, you know, when, when I got this illness, you were been right there by my side. And I just want you to know something. And with that, she leans in and her heart's, you know, filling up because she just knows he's going to tell her how much he loves her. And he says, I just think you're bad luck. <laughs> Okay, that was a bad joke. I know, a bad joke. But it just led us perfectly into our theme for the month uh, and, of course, continuing for today, which is the idea of luck. And the question we are posing this month, the month of St. Patrick's Day and, you know, the whole idea of the luck of the Irish and lucky charms and all that good stuff, uh, this month we're focusing on the question, what does luck have to do with it? Kind of a play on our last month, which was what does love have to do with it? But this month is what does luck have to do with it? And what is our, an our one word answer to that question? Luck has what to do with it? Nothing. nothing. Luck has nothing to do with it. Well, we say we know that. We think we know that. We in our brain say we know that. But do we really? Do we really know that? I think the world doesn't know that. If you just, you know, go out outside of our, you know, kind of our little cocoon of, of our science of mind community here and, uh, and beyond this, this church, but people in this mindset, people who study new thought and, um, you know, other denominations of, of new thought, unity and divine science and other religious science folks, if we get outside that bubble, if you will, and go out into the world, the world thinks that uh, our experience is oftentimes just the luck of the draw and they drew the short stick and I just pose because I always like us to think deeply and really look and be authentic and honest and real how many times do we actually kind of think that that chance had that happen or boy we were just in the wrong place at the wrong time and you know that was just a stroke of bad luck we may not say those words but we may feel that we are subject to conditions. What we know, and I want to reiterate today, is that we are not. That our luck, and I'm going to put that in air quotes always. So whenever I say luck, or lucky, or unlucky, or any, you know, anything like that, I'm going to put them in quotes, but I'm going to try not to do that because I know how irritating that can be if somebody just always does that. So in first service, I couldn't keep my hands away from that, so I'm going to try not to do that today. We believe that our luck is created by the consciousness that we bring. And the consciousness that we bring that creates the best luck of all is the consciousness, meaning the fullness of our beliefs and our, the way we think and the way we act and the way we feel, is based on knowing that there is a power and presence greater than we are that lives as us. And that that greater power and presence is God's source, energy, whatever word or phrase you want to use. But that it exists, it is as tangible and real as we are sitting here, even though we can't necessarily see it in its unformed version. But we see it in its formed version all the time, just take a look around. Here it is. So our luck is not dependent upon circumstance and happenstance. It is dependent upon our relationship with the source of our being that lives and moves and has its being as us. We are lucky when we are in alignment with that. We are unlucky when we are not. Last Sunday, I spoke a bit about the master teacher Jesus' beautiful statement of be ye in this world, but not of this world. If you want to know more about that, listen to last week's talk. Um, I just wanted to give you a little quick reminder of that. So this whole month is based on the idea that luck has nothing to do with it. 
However, there, not however, and uh, there's been uh, uh, 10 years worth of research done many, many years ago in England that uh, Dr. Richard Weissman conducted 10 years of research with thousands of people participating in a whole bunch of different studies and scenarios and taking questionnaires to determine do people who have lucky, let me see, I started to do it, lucky experiences <laughs> have a different way of being and showing up in the world than those who have unlucky experiences? And in fact, the answer is yes. They show up differently in the world. And then he wrote a book called The Luck Factor and talks about four attributes, ways of being that lucky people share that unlucky people don't. And so we're taking one each Sunday. Last Sunday we took, um, ex actually la last Sunday we took Expect the Best. <laughs> we took Expect the Best, become a living embodiment of those expectations of the best. Today this is twofold and it's all about maximizing. It's about maximizing two things. One, maximizing what we already have, whether that's internally, internal resources, skills, talent, heart, love, what, what is inside of us, divine source, here, there that is, as well as what is out here we have out here in the tangible world. Maximize what we already have. And here's the thing, if you don't hear anything else out of today, I want you to hear this, all right? If you don't walk away with anything else, walk away with this. You always have more than you realize. Way more than you realize. So that's idea number one with maximizing. The second idea is to maximize the opportunities, the quote, un mm -hmm, here I go, the quote unquote chance opportunities that get presented in front of you. See them, act upon them. In other words, maximize them. So let's start with maximizing what you already have. There is no greater example of that than appears in our Judeo-Christian scripture in Matthew where the master teacher Jesus has been teaching and preaching for a long time. Now you guys think I talk a long time. No, no, no. You know, I'm like 30 minutes at the most. Okay, sometimes you clocked me longer than that. Yeah, okay. But anyway, th his was hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. And he's been healing and <clears throat> doing all this work and all these people are there. The Bible tells us 5,000. Well, it's always reported 5,000 people, right? You know, the st you know the story, right? It's not 5,000 people. The Bible, the scripture says 5,000 men. <laughs> and a little, little line, and women and children. Yeah, so the, the men got counted, the women and children did not. I won't go off on that piece. I, <laughs> but let's just say they were more than five, a lot more than 5,000 people. So there's a bunch of people, a lot of people, 10,000 people or more, who are getting hangry. Do you know what hangry is? Yeah, yeah, you're, hung, you're getting angry because you're hungry. They're getting hangry and restless. The natives are getting restless, and the disciples are noticing this, and they go to Jesus and say, hey, guy, you know, we got to do something here. we got to feed. And Jesus is like, what are you talking about? I didn't, this isn't a catered event. I didn't bring <laughs> caterers here. Okay, he may not have said that exactly like that, but <laughs> something to that effect. And then he says, okay, well, here, we, i got to do something. So let's gather up what people have. Let's just pass, let's pass the baskets and see what people have. Let's gather up. Actually, he asked a little boy, didn't he? There was a little boy. There was a little boy there who had, he didn't go to the whole crowd. Thank you for that download of my scripture. He didn't go to the whole crowd. He, there was a little boy who had what? What did he have? How many? Do we know? Five loaves of bread, two fish. This is what he got handed to him. Now, just think, put yourself in the position of Jesus. You receive, you have a throng of people who are getting hangry. And you are given five loaves of bread and, and two fish. Please, give me a break. What am I supposed to do with this? This won't even feed me, and I'm getting hangry too, right? This is, not, this is nothing. This is not enough. How many times have we done that? We've looked at what we have. It's not enough. We've looked at who we are, and we've said we're not enough. It's not enough. I can't do anything with this. I can't work with this. It's not enough. The person who is lucky maximizes what they have been given, what they have. And they maximize it. Jesus gave us the formula for it. They maximize it by doing 
two things. He was, who said, I heard it. He was grateful for it, and he blessed it. He was grateful for what he had, and he blessed it. And then he moved forward. So that's what he did. They passed baskets. Everybody got something to eat, and there was more left over. Whether you choose to look at this as an actual historical event that actually happened, or a metaphor, that's your choice. I love this denomination. You have choice. But it, whichever it is, it's an amazing example and story of how when we bless and are grateful for what we have, it manifests. Now, I just want to tell you, first service didn't hear this because I didn't know it, but Leah Holtzman, who you met a few minutes ago, who's overseeing the spring fling, is also in charge of our kitchen. And she oversees the Bountiful Bees on Sunday morning, which is the um, food and drink available for us after service. So she came running to me after first service and says, I have to tell you something, it just fits so perfectly into your talk. She says, never before, never before have I had this happen. I had 23 loaves of bread delivered this morning <laughs> and shrimp. So we have loaves and fishes physically in, <laughs> in there today, more than we've ever had before. So go enjoy after, after service. I'm not quite done talking yet, but go enjoy the bounty. <laughs> and Leah has probably turned those 23 loaves into, you know, 50 loaves, knowing, knowing her as we do. So here it is. Here's the deal. There's a basic, fundamental, universal principle that says this. Form follows thought. Like attracts like. What you focus on increases. If you focus on what you already have, with gratitude and blessing, it will expand. If you focus on what you already have with a not enough attitude, it will expand. Not enough will expand. That is the way it works. That is an infallible, immutable law. It works that way 100% of the time for 100% of the people. No exceptions. No one is outside of that law, just like no one is outside the law of gravity. We all are impacted by it. We are all impacted by the basic law that says like attracts like. What we focus on increases. What we focus on increases. I have to say that again. <laughs> what we focus on increases. When we love and bless that which we already have, it will expand. So here's the thing. We cannot think about not having enough 98% of our time and then spend 2% of it slapping on some affirmations of prosperity and abundance and good and expect there to be a change inside of us and therefore a change outside. It doesn't work that way. I see that happen sometimes. I see people say, well, you know, I use these affirmations and they don't work. Well, what do you, where is your brain most of the time? Where is your embodiment most of the time? That's a question just to be thought about. So that's the idea of maximizing what you already have to increase your lucky experiences. The second part of this is the, is the doing, is the activity. And I told you last Sunday when I announced this talk that there's a very specific activity that lucky people engage in. And that activity is they see and act upon opportunities. I want to give you an example that is from the book, The Luck Factor. It was part of this 10 years worth of study. <clears throat> Dr. Weissman wanted to see if there was any difference in the way people who have good luck and people who have bad luck, if there's any difference in the way they respond to opportunities put in front of them. So this is what he set up. He had a man by the name of Martin and a woman by the name of Brenda. From pr they were participating in the Luck Project is what it was called. And he, they had filled out forms and done surveys. And from that, he, he, meaning Dr. Weissman, had determined that uh, the Martin, the man, had good luck. He just had lucky things happen all the time. Brenda did not have such good luck. She just had all this all terrible circumstances. And she was in the wrong place at the wrong time on a regular basis. So he, they were pretty ex on the extreme end. So he wanted to use them for this experiment. He told them independently and to come at different times to go to a coffee shop and wait and meet someone from the Luck Project who was going to then bring them to the office. 
Well, that was just a ruse to get them to the experiment. And here was the experiment. They were going to put two opportunities in front of both of each of them, Martin and Brenda, and see what they did with these opportunities. The first opportunity was that they put a 10-pound note, remember this was England, they put a 5-pound, rather, 5-pound note right outside the door as you were walking into the coffee shop. So it was right there on the ground. And then the other thing they said, that's opportunity number one, Opportunity number two was that they arranged the coffee shop so that there was only four tables in there, and they had four uh, different people planted at each table, so Brenda and Martin were going to have to sit with somebody, and one person who was one of the plants was a six, looked like a very successful businessman. He was dressed to the nines in an expensive suit. He looked successful. The other three, we'll just say, not so much. So... Martin was the first one to come, and he comes tooling up to the, to the door, and he looks down, and he sees that five-pound note. He bends down. He picks it up, puts it in his wallet, goes to order coffee, probably actually spends it on his coffee, looks around, beelines to the man successfully dressed, sits down. Within a minute, he's having a conversation with the man. He says, may I buy you coffee? Because he's feeling abundant, right? He just got five pounds. He goes and gets the man coffee, and they have this lovely conversation. Then someone from the experiment comes to get him, and off he goes to Dr. Wiseman's office. Now, it's Brenda's a lot of time. They've replaced, put another five-pound note there on the ground. Brenda comes tooling up to the door, walks to the door, opens the door, walks on in. Does not see that five-pound note right there. Goes up to the counter, orders her coffee. She, like Martin, sits next to the successful, quote-unquote, quote unquote, businessman, and, and yet says nothing, says not a word to him, not a word to anybody. Finally, someone comes, gets her, takes her to Weissman's office. Weissman asks both of them, so tell me about your day, your morning so far, how'd it go? Any lucky or unlucky events happen? Here's Brenda's answer. No, nothing happened, just a normal morning. He asked Martin, Martin, did you have a, any lucky or unlucky experience today? He says, oh my gosh, what a day. This is truly my lucky day. I'm walking into the coffee shop and I find a five pound note sitting right there. Then I go in and, and I sit next to this you know, immaculately dressed man and we start having coffee together and he shares with me some amazing information. It was just such an enriching experience. This truly was an amazingly lucky day. Exact same opportunities very different experiences. People who consider themselves lucky maximize their opportunities. They see them and they act upon them. Now here's the very cool thing, that we have opportunities all the time. There is an endless amount of opportunities. You may be one who thinks, you know what, I've I've used up all my, I've blown all these opportunities. I've used them up. And that's an attitude that you come into this world with a finite number of opportunities and there's somebody up in the sky checking off like, okay, so you've had one, you blew that, you've had another, you blew that, there's that one. Okay, no more, you're done with opportunities. No, there is limitless opportunity available to us. And I love this from our Science of Mind textbook, page 291. If we had and apparently lost many opportunities, we must be shown that we stand at the point of limitless opportunity, that opportunity is right here today, that we see it and grasp it. It recognizes us as we recognize it. We exist in limitless opportunities which are forever seeking expression through us. I want to share with you another quote from The Luck Factor, the book on all this research and it sounds like it also could come out of our science of mind textbook listen to this lucky people are often convinced that their opportunities are the result of pure chance they just happen to open newspapers at the right time come across the right page on the internet walk in on the internet walk down the street at the right time or go to a party and meet just the right person but my work revealed <coughs> that their that these seemingly chance opportunities are the result of lucky people's psychological makeup. The way they think 
and behave makes them far more likely than others to create, I underscore that word, to create, notice, and act on chance opportunities in their lives. I discovered that being in the right place at the right time is actually all about being in the right state of mind. <laughs> Could have been Ernest Holmes writing that. It was, in fact, Dr. Richard Weissman. And I love that. The way they think and behave makes them far more likely than others to create. That's not chance. It's not a chance opportunity. It's an opportunity we created. And then we notice it, and then we act on it. Depends on our state of mind. So I want to give you um, a definition, a definition for luck that I love. And it's very funny, a chance coincidence, that in our first service, Lori Murray, who was our spiritual life coach who did the opening prayer, she told me before service, she goes, oh, I'm so excited I get to do the opening prayer for luck because I get to quote my favorite definition for luck. So she quotes it in the opening prayer. I'm like, oh, I'm going to quote that in service. So how that beautiful that was. So here's a great definition of luck. When preparedness meets opportunity. Luck is when preparedness meets opportunity. Preparedness, yes, it might be tilling the soil out here in the world, but it's also preparing us inside. How are we preparing ourselves through our, our mentality, through our, what we know, what we believe, what we think? How are we preparing ourselves? So I'm going to give you a story, a personal story now of preparedness meeting opportunity. It happened in 1989. Some of you have heard this before, but you, maybe you haven't heard maybe the whole thing or even seen the demonstration you're going to get in a second. Uh, so it's 1989. <coughs> I have found the first Church of Religious Science. I have been it's in this building. I have been coming for about a year. I have drunk the Kool-Aid. Let's just put it that way. I <laughs> no, for those of you who are new, we don't have any Kool-Aid. I promise. <laughs> no Kool-Aid ever. I, well, we might back there, but it's all it's safe. Yeah, you don't have to drink it. <laughs> I had immersed myself in this belief system because it was changing my life. It made so much sense. It was filling a hole in my heart that I'd had that I was trying to fill with relationships, which I could not do, by the way. I could not, to save my life, create a relationship that worked. I'm trying to fill this hole in my heart with, with relationships when, in fact, it was a relationship with the divine that I needed. So I'm here, I'm, and ministry is a long, not even a glean in my eye yet, a long way away. Um, but I'm here, and I'm also doing some emotional house cleaning uh, it's been about a year, and I feel like, you know what, I think I've prepared myself now enough to be ready to maybe have that sacred and holy relationship that I still want. I know now that it isn't going to fill every need of mine. Source is the only one that can fill that, and I'm developing that relationship. And I also still want to have a love relationship in my life. That's important to me. That's planted on my heart to have. And I think I'm getting ready. I think in the words of today, I've prepared myself for that. So as luck would have it, <laughs> right, chance opportunities, I meet through a work project. I worked for a law firm at the time, uh, and we have to have something designed by a designer, and the d designer has been designated, and that designer, who ha whose office happens to be directly across the street from my office, is one Lonnie Whittington. Oh, Oh, there you have it. You, some of you know that name, right? Uh-huh. So I go to his office and I think, whoa, this is, not, this is a nice piece of business here. I'm liking that. <laughs> I liked it a lot. And then I realize, and then I talk to him and he's really nice and wow, this is great. But I leave and, you know, we're done with the business at hand. We had a couple of things. I had to meet him again. I fluffed up a little bit more before I met him the second time. Uh, but then business was done. We're done. The, this is done. The project is done. Well, I don't know, guys, if you do this, but I think women tend to do this. At least I did this. I, I, well, I couldn't, pr I couldn't not think about him. I'm thinking, mate, you know, who knows? This could be the one. Don't we do that? Oh, he's the one, right? This is the, he or she's the one, right? But then I had to ask every friend I had, what should I do? You know, tell me, how should I handle this? What should I do? Do you think I should call him? Do you think I should? And I got some of the wackiest pieces of advice. Because I wasn't, you know, I didn't know. He could have been married. I didn't know. He could have been gay. He was very nicely dressed. Very, you know, <laughs> really crisp and clean and like, well, 
he's artistic. He had really cool music on his office, and his office was sleek. And I'm like, okay, he could be gay. I, and if that's the case, he's not going to be interested in me. I just don't know. So how can I know? So I had one friend give me the wackiest advice. I did not follow it. Her advice was, this is what you should do. You should call his office, because I had his number, and ask for Mrs. Whittington. <laughs> and just see what happens. I did not follow that advice. But a friend said, well, if you're too nervous to call him, which I was, I'm like, I can't call him. Oh, no. If you're too nervous to call him, why don't you write him a letter? Oh, well, now that's interesting. I could write him a letter. And so I did. You want to hear the letter? It's, it's October 23rd, 1989. Lonnie, I really appreciated meeting you recently in connection with my law firm's acknowledgement in the program for the Bloom Memorial Concert and would enjoy getting to know you better. Because I am suggesting a move from the professional context to a personal one, parentheses, and because I am pretty much of a wimp when it comes to things like this, parentheses, I thought a note might be the most appropriate. Interpreted, that means if you're not interested or not available or whatever, your silence can serve as your thanks but no thanks. But in the event you are interested and available or whatever, give me a call. Left my number, sincerely, Michelle. <laughs> I saw and, and acted upon an opportunity. And I wrote this, and I sent it, and then I was a mess. I was a <laughs> mess. A mess. Second guessing myself, why did I do that? You're such an idiot. He's going to think you're nuts. You know, oh, you know, I, we do that, yes? It took him forever to call me, forever. I think it was three days. <laughs> and we have to allow for the time for the letter to get there, right? which was probably two days <laughs> for it to get there. He called me, pick up the phone. He says, hi, this is Lonnie Whittington. Yes, I'm interested. Yes, I'm available. Would you like to have dinner? <laughs> oh. So it's 1989. This year we celebrate, this, this month we celebrate 27, I always look at that, 20, thank you for shaking your head, 27 years of being married, of this amazing, the relationship I wanted in my wildest dreams, honestly wasn't sure at that point it could even happen, but it did because not only did I act on my opportunity that was in front of me, so did he. It had to be a two-way street. He did too. He said yes to me. You know, there it is. There I am. Uh, he said yes to that. Now, here's the fun thing, uh, kind of. I can laugh at now. At first, it was, oh. I asked him a little later after we were in the relationship, it's very clear that this is going to go somewhere. We didn't know yet where. We didn't know it would be, you know, this 29-year uh, relationship, a 50-year relationship, however long it's going to go, 100 years, however long it will go. I don't know how much more we got. A long, long time. Um, but I said to him, so would you have ever called me? <laughs> would you have initiated this? Guess what the answer was? No. Okay, so my ego had to, like, get picked up off the ground. <laughs> oh, oh. It had nothing to do with that. But he had had, um, let's just say, not very good luck, we'll put it that way, in relationships. Some of you have heard that story. He gave a whole sermon about it. Uh, and he was wounded and damaged and bruised and burned and was never going to date again. That's where his mind was. And then I show up. And he said yes to it. So I uh, thank you. I was just about to go there. <laughs> it wasn't me. I didn't frame the letter. I wouldn't frame this letter. It's his letter. He framed this letter. And it is in his office, hanging on the wall. To at, well, not at this moment, because it's here. But <laughs> as a, it, it sits in his office. And we just had our house repainted this week. Oh, that's fun. And, um, you know, basically kind of have to move out and then move back in in three days. And um, he, he said to me this morning after first service, he says, you know, I've read this letter about four or five times this week because I had to t I've taken it down, I've cleaned it, I've cleaned it again, I've put it back up I, and moved it a couple times. I've been, I've been reading this letter. So 
the lesson here is, the moral of this story is, chance opportunities don't happen by chance. You've created them. You've drawn them to you. But if you don't see them and act upon them, they will just float by. The good news is there's an infinite number of opportunities that are ready to unfold for you. So you have an assignment for this week, and I will be checking in next week, all right? So here is your assignment, or as they say, your mission, should you choose to accept it. Is this week, have your eyes open for two, not just one, two opportunities. And then what are you going to do with that? Thank you. Three of you will act on it. Yes. <laughs> Look for two opportunities and act on it. And I'm going to ask for a report. How did it go? I want to know how it went. Take a chance. Take a chance. I want to bring our time to a close this morning with a meditation from Ernest Holmes, from our Science of Mind textbook, that will be our closing prayer. So I invite you to close your eyes. On page 305, take a deep breath. This is written in the first person, I statement, so make them your I statements. And it goes like this. My opportunities are unlimited. There is a divine urge to express. It permeates me and fills all space and all people. All of my affairs are in its hands. To it are clearly visible the best ways, methods, and means for my greater expression. I leave my affairs in the hands of this principle and I cooperate with it. Today, the possibilities of my experiences are unlimited. Spirit flows through me, inspiring me and sustaining that inspiration. I have ability and talent, and I am busy using them. This talent is divinely sustained and marketed under a universal plan of right action. Life lies open to me, full, rich, and abundant. My thought, which is my key to life, opens all doors for me. I am one with infinity divinity, and I realize this unity. I proceed on my way knowing that God goes with me into an eternal day of infinite opportunities. I have only to open the portals of my mind and soul and accept that which is already ready to express through me. Today, I fling these portals wide. Today, I am the instrument through which life flows. And so it is, and so we let it be.